After centuries of nomadic domination, the world is about to bend to a new master. The three Islamic gunpowder empires, the Ottoman Turks, the Safavids in Iran, and the Mughals in the Indian subcontinent, control Western, Central, and South Asia because of their new technologies. In Europe, a deeply tired continent emerges from the Middle Ages with new realizations and new ambitions. During the post-classical period, Africa and the Americas produced some of the most advanced and successful societies on the planet, but not even they could prepare for what was to come. East Asia would begin to pursue isolationism from the West near the end of the last period. In China, the Ming inherited the Song's advanced technical knowledge, but while the Chinese went through a period of industrialization, they would not go through a scientific revolution, meaning there was nothing to counter or challenge traditional belief systems. This could be responsible for what caused them to falter as arguably the world's leading civilization. While having invented gunpowder, it wasn't the Chinese, but the Europeans who invented the matchlock, creating the classic firearms that were so useful in warfare. Early on, the Ming would see large-scale urbanization. Cities like Nanjing and Beijing would swell in population and see the rise of private industries. More silk products were produced, along with cotton and paper. Smaller markets would focus more on food production. Before the Ming's isolation, they would actually have a very profitable trade system with the Portuguese, Spanish, and Dutch. This gave them access to silver, which they needed to back their paper money, which crashed by the mid-1400s, suffering from hyperinflation. Once the Ming became isolationist, silver would still find its way onto the mainland. This abundance of silver from the Spanish helped the Chinese economy survive. In the late 1500s, Japan would invade Joseon Korea, in what would be known as the Imjin War. China sent an army to protect Korea and themselves, and were ultimately the victors, but this left them stretched thin. To make matters worse, the Little Ice Age that affected the North Atlantic, also affected Ming China, specifically their food sources. Trading partners cut off exchanges, and Chinese crops began to fail. Along with other natural disasters and widespread disease outbreaks, the Ming were deemed to have lost the mandate of heaven, and rebels would begin to stir. In a peasant uprising, Li Jicheng would succeed in overthrowing the Ming at Beijing, with the Chongjin Emperor committing suicide. Prince Dorgan, who would form the next dynasty though, allied with a former Ming general, Wu Sangui, and took Beijing themselves, forcing rebel Li Jicheng to flee the city, and established the Qing dynasty. This dynasty wouldn't be ethnically Han, like the Ming, but Manchu. These Manchus were descended from the Jurchen, who invaded from the north during the Song dynasty last period. Establishing the dynasty in 1644, they would go on to be the most popular state in the world, and the fourth largest empire in history. They would administer Chinese affairs with a traditional Confucian style, and left most of the ethnic minorities to their own devices. This dynasty would survive this period, but fall in 1912. In Japan, the Sengoku period of civil war continued. The powerful Oda Nobunaga had just deposed the last of the Ashikaga shogunate, and went on a warpath to unify the country. In 1582, his dreams would almost escape him, but he lost something arguably just as valuable. Betrayed by one of his generals, Nobunaga was forced to commit suicide, or seppuku, at the Honoji Temple. His successor, Taiotomi Hideyoshi, took over the mission and succeeded, ending the strife-filled Sengoku period. He was the one who set into motion the Japanese invasion of Korea, which ultimately failed. After his death in 1598, and with the Taiotomi's credibility now in question after the failed invasion, Tokugawa Ieyasu would challenge his son, Taiotomi Hideyori. This came to a head in 1600, at the Battle of Sekigahara, where Tokugawa was victorious, and was proclaimed shogun of the new Tokugawa shogunate, in 1603. 
This marked the beginning of the Edo period, which saw the shogun rule from the Edo castle, in the capital of Edo, former name of Tokyo. It was a feudal system like the other shogunates, with a strict hierarchy, previously established by Taiotomi Hideyoshi. The feudal lords of the Tokugawa clan ruled, with their warrior class of samurai underneath, a similar system to Europe. Farmers and artisans were ranked below them. The Tokugawa would close off the island country from foreigners with its Sokoku policy, which also kept commoners from leaving. Literacy rates rose during this time, although this could be attributed to other factors. In the smaller areas of Japan, the daimyo feudal lords would often also train in the fighting arts and be samurai. By the same token, samurai could also be the proper lords of their region. Daimyo would forge alliances by exchanging relatives, and daimyo families would stay near Edo Castle, to ensure loyalty. Because of the strict hierarchical system, there would often be dissatisfaction and conflict. But interestingly enough, not in the way one would expect. Instead of peasant uprisings, it was the samurai and daimyos who were cut short. With fixed tax rates and rising inflation, taxes collected by landowners would be worth less and less, leading to angry nobles and angry samurai. The system would still be maintained though, and the Edo period would last for over 200 years. In 1392, the middle of the post-classical period in Korea, Yi Songye established the Joseon dynasty, and the capital was eventually moved to Seoul. King Sejong the Great, the fourth king of this dynasty, was responsible for replacing Chinese characters to create the Korean alphabet. The Japanese invasions of Korea would occur in the late 1500s, but how exactly did they fail? The answer was this man. Admiral Yi Soon Shin. He headed a fearsome Korean navy, consisting of oddly shaped ships. They would be completely enclosed in metallic armor, with spikes on top to prevent boarding. With a dragon's head poking out the front, these ships would resemble a type of turtle. These turtle ships, called kobuksen in Korean, were also fearsome offensive weapons, capable of firing at least five different types of cannon. Combined with the panics and warships, they would win a stunning 16 out of 16 battles, utterly destroying the entire Japanese navy. In 1597, at the Battle of Chil Chol Yang, after a bit of trickery, the entire Korean fleet was destroyed by the Japanese. Korea would have the last laugh, as the few remaining turtle ships were revived and altered. A combined force of Ming Chinese and Korean warships put an end to the Japanese advance at Noryang, ending the war. In the 1600s, Korea was once again invaded, this time from the Jurchen, who would soon change their identity to Manchu, the same peoples who would form the Qing dynasty in China. Korean King Injo surrendered in 1637 and was forced to send concubines and noblewomen to the Qing Prince Dorgan. After the constant invasions, Joseon Korea experienced almost 200 years of peace. Internal problems are what caused the dynasty to decline in the late 1800s, but the Joseon would remain stable during most of the early modern period. The Delhi Sultanate, early 16th century. This sultanate would have control of the Indian subcontinent for over 300 years. Ibrahim Lodhi, of the Afghan Lodi dynasty, would be the last of these rulers. An invading army under Babur, a descendant of both Timur and Genghis Khan, would kill the last Lodi Sultan at the Battle of Panipat, and establish the Mughal Empire, one of the Islamic gunpowder empires. The Mughals adopted much of the Persian culture and would become one of the richest and productive regions in the world. Their GDP surpassed the entirety of Europe during the early modern period, and it was valued at around a quarter of the GDP of the entire planet. During the Mughal Classic period, the empire was highly centralized, with advances in the arts and architecture. With the death of Emperor Aurangzeb, the empire would stagnate, but still survive for another 150 years after losing hegemony to a mobile group of warriors. 
These Hindu Maratha were located to the southwest and would expand under their Peshwas, or prime ministers. This ended when the Afghan Empire, backed by the Mughals, halted their expansion, but they succeeded in taking over most of the Indian subcontinent. They would later be divided into a confederacy of Maratha states. Near the end of the early modern period, colonial powers practiced new imperialism, a phase which saw Europeans, after their earlier colonial pursuits in the Western Hemisphere, attempt to colonize and exploit Africa and the East. India was no exception. In 1757, at the Battle of Plassey, the Nawab of Bengal, part of the Mughal Empire, surrendered his territory to the British East India Company. The British would soon be given the Diwani, or ability to collect revenue, and established a capital at Calcutta. Next on their list was a more formidable force, the Maratha. The Anglo-Maratha Wars were a series of three wars fought between the Hindu Empire and the British. While the Maratha succeeded in the first, the British dominated the last two, ending up with both Mughal and Maratha territory. As the Dutch East India Company was also a fierce competitor for territory in Southeast Asia, the British had to negotiate treaties in order to assign possessions. After rebellion and turmoil, the British dissolved their East India Company, preferring to administer the region themselves. This was known as the British Raj. Colonial rule would continue to spread in Southeast Asia, with only Thailand, or Siam, avoiding the same fate as its mainland neighbors. Off the coast, in Indonesia, the powerful Hindu empire of the Majapahit, lay at a crucial point in the spice route, which connected Indian and Chinese ports. Though their influence spread to surrounding islands, the Majapahit would fall before the mid-1500s, after the emergence of numerous Malay sultanates. The Portuguese would conquer the Malacca Sultanate by 1511, taking control over the strategic Strait of Malacca. In the Middle East, the crossroads of the Old World, tensions remained. West Asia had a new king, the Ottomans. After their conquest of Constantinople, the Ottoman Empire entered its classical age, a period of expansion and pursuit of power. They expanded into North Africa, capturing Egypt in 1517, and establishing the Regency of Algiers, Ottoman Tunis, and the Eilat of Tripolitana. Morocco remained an independent Berber state. In the latter part of this period, Ottoman land in North Africa, the Middle East, and the Balkans would experience what historians call Pax Ottomana, a period of economic prosperity and stability, not unlike the Pax Mongolica of the previous era. There would be conflict though, with a new enemy to the east. Safavid Persia Founded around 1501, this empire was the first native Persian empire since the fall of the Sassanids in the 600s. Being Shia, they would be under constant threat from the Sunni Ottomans. Nonetheless, the Safavids would spread their version of Islam into various parts of the Middle East. The Safavids grew to be a major power because of trade. Europeans, especially England and the Netherlands, were quite fond of Persian rugs, along with their silks and other textiles. They would grow weaker and fall in 1736, but their legacy lived on in the strengthening and spread of Twelver Shia Islam. Central Asia Where some nomads still rule Turkic Uzbek confederacies occupied this area, united by Muhammad Shaybani Khan. From the steppes, he came, at the helm of various tribes like the Kipchaks, Naaman, and other Turkic tribes. Closer to India, the Pashtuns, or Afghans, came to prominence under the Hataki dynasty in the mid-1600s. They launched invasions both to the east, in India, and the west, in Iran. The Pashtun Ghazis, or warriors of the faith, would form the aforementioned Lothi dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate, the final dynasty before its collapse to the Mughals. In the west, they would also invade the Safavid Empire, handing it a devastating blow at the Battle of Gulnabad, a blow the empire wouldn't recover from. 
the Afghans would later form the Afghan Empire, or Durrani Empire in the 1700s, which halted the Hindu Maratha expansion. Man is the measure of all things. This idea, attributed to Protagoras, one of the ancient Greek sophists, would be at the center of the humanist movement in Europe. Birthed out of Italy, still during the late Middle Ages, humanism manifested itself in the Renaissance, which would later spread all across the continent, bringing Europe into the modern age. Using man, or human, as the basis of what we can know and learn, they began to use inductive reasoning and physical observation in the sciences. Arts and literature blossomed as well. Linear perspective began appearing in paintings, and images were more lifelike and natural, often depicting ordinary people in majestic light. Literature began to use more common language, and with the emergence of the printing press, became more available to more people. Warfare also changed dramatically. Though gunpowder was invented in the East, once they possessed the technology, it was the Europeans who created the most effective firearms. Able to pierce even the finest of armor, the classic burdensome nightwear fell out of fashion. With cannon also utilizing this gunpowder, castles would be rendered nearly useless, as the walls had difficulty withstanding the potent weapon. Renaissance ideals eventually opened the door for more scientific advancements. Influenced by the works of Al-Urdi, a Syrian astronomer from the Islamic Golden Age, Nicholas Copernicus would help to replace the faulty geocentric model of the solar system, which claimed the Sun and all planets moved around the Earth, with the heliocentric model, in which the Earth and all other planets move around the Sun. This is widely regarded as the beginnings of the scientific revolution. This continued for the majority of the early modern period, with the creation or advancement of numerous scientific fields, like biology, geology, and physics. They would surpass or replace much of the classical era sciences, Aristotelian physics being a prime example. Many of these ideas directly challenged the church. Catholicism wasn't only threatened by science, but by other variants of Christianity. In the late Middle Ages, Yang Hus, a Christian reformer in Bohemia, was executed for heresy. His followers, known as Hussites, began spreading this version of Christianity, and feeling threatened, the Catholic Church would engage in a series of crusades against the Hussites. While the wars would simply end in compromise, they were significant, as they were the first European war fought where gunpowder was a factor. Hussite soldiers were able to dispatch far larger numbers of the Holy Roman Emperor's Crusaders. Christianity in Europe would also be greatly challenged by foreign empires. After their victory at Constantinople, the Ottomans expanded into Eastern Europe, where they laid siege to Belgrade. John Hunyadi, of the Kingdom of Hungary, who had been fighting the Turks for decades, masterminded a counterattack on the Ottoman camp. Though outnumbered, the Eastern Europeans would drive back the Turkish army, wounding Mehmed II in the process. Seen as a pivotal moment in Christian history, Hunyadi's victory kept the Ottomans from expanding throughout Europe. In the late 1400s, the Spanish crown established the Tribunal of the Holy Cross of the Inquisition. This saw the Church prosecute Catholics for heresy and other acts deemed against the faith. This included sorcery and witchcraft, as well as Judaizing, and blasphemy. This Spanish Inquisition would last all the way until the 19th century. The Electorate of Saxony nestled within the Holy Roman Empire. In 1508, the University at Wittenberg would accept an Augustinian monk as professor of philosophy. He then became a preacher at the local church. In 1517, on the 31st of October, this monk, Martin Luther, posted a critique of the Pope and Church on the Church's bulletin board. These would become known as the 95 Theses, and were mainly critical of the practice of selling indulgences, and the Catholic view of purgatory. Debates soon became commonplace, leading to those protesting the Church, and the Protestant Reformation. Different Protestant denominations emerged from this, including the Lutherans, after Martin Luther, Calvinists, and Presbyterians. 
In England, it yielded the English Reformation, which saw the rise of Anglicanism. In 1521, at the Diet of Worms, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V declared Luther a heretic, but occupied with affairs in Eastern Europe, left it up to the German nobles to deal with Luther, if they saw fit. In 1530, Charles ordered all Protestants to revert to Catholicism, leading to the Protestants banding together in the Schmalkaldic League, a military alliance of Lutheran princes. In 1555, the Treaty of Augsburg was signed by Charles and the League, which gave local rulers the choice between either Lutheranism or Catholicism for their state. The Catholic Church wasn't about to take challenges to its power lightly. The Council of Trent was called, in reaction to this Protestant Reformation, sparking a Counter-Reformation, and Catholic Revival. Seminaries were founded for the training of new priests, and new religious orders, like the Jesuits and Capuchins, helped to fight the corruption in the Church and strengthen its reputation. New spiritual movements would begin in the major Catholic bastions, like the Spanish mystics, and French school of spirituality. In Italy and Malta, there was the Roman Inquisition. Eastern Europe Ivan IV, the Grand Prince of Moscow has dreams of grandeur. Declaring himself Caesar, or Tsar, Ivan the Terrible went on a campaign to unify the various Turkic Khanates and Rus principalities in the region. He nearly doubled the area of this new large Tsardom of Russia, a multi-ethnic state, spanning two continents. The Atlantic Ocean The early modern period saw this expanse of water become much more crowded. In Western Europe, the Age of Discovery teamed with European seafarers, traveling to find gold, silver, and spices, as their previous routes via the Silk Road were now controlled by the Ottomans. Europe's position on the globe enabled it to take to maritime expansion more easily than most other regions. The dominant economic ideology at this time was mercantilism. This school of thought dictated for an economy to maximize its exports and minimize imports. It wasn't a free market economy, and it led to massive government intervention, often with militaristic and imperialist motives, in order to achieve their goals. This economic model was part of the commercial revolution, which saw the European economy expand. European states began to compete with one another, not militarily, but economically. On top of simple commerce, there would be a stark increase in other financial endeavors, like insurance, banking and investments. In the search for precious metals and spices, the Portuguese would have a maritime breakthrough. The Carrick and Caravel were state-of-the-art ship designs, which made traveling on the ravaging waters of the Atlantic possible. Theory state that the Portuguese and Spanish of the Iberia Peninsula were the first to begin this new age of discovery, because they were in desperate need of gold and bullion due to their recent war with the Islamic settlements in Spain during the Reconquista. More traffic on the highways of the ocean led to more bandits. From the mid-1600s to the mid-1700s, the golden age of piracy would reign. This period began with Anglo-French buccaneers based in the Caribbean, attacking nearby Spanish colonies. Later on, the Pirate Round, a route across the Atlantic and around the tip of Africa, was a popular method of attacking both Muslim and British East India targets in the Indian Ocean. Later still, after the War of Spanish Succession, many privateers and sailors, now unemployed, would take up piracy. They couldn't let those maritime skills go to waste now could they? Back in Europe, after the disastrous Thirty Years' War, which killed up to 8 million people, the church was less of a unifying force, and residents would associate more with their state. This allowed monarchs to claw for more claims to absolute power, there would be a decrease in feudalism from the previous period, as all power was now centralized in the monarch, who claimed legitimacy from a higher power. The nobles would have less control, and taxes would sharply increase as well. One of these absolute monarchs was Louis XIV, or the Sun King. 
He shepherded France through three major wars, one of which was the War of Spanish Succession, where European powers banded together to stop a unification of the French and Spanish crown under one Bourbon king, as it would upset the balance of power on the continent. The king's ambitions died, as France and Spain lost the war to the English and United Provinces of the Netherlands. This Treaty of Utrecht, from the early 1700s, marks the end of Spanish naval dominance, with the British the new hegemonic maritime power. In England, the English Civil War saw the Royalists, who supported the King, battle the Parliamentarians, who supported Parliament. The Parliamentarians were victorious, and Charles I was executed, his son Charles II, exiled. The British Isles were then united under Oliver Cromwell. In the 1660s, the English Restoration saw the return of Charles II to the throne. In 1688, in what would be known as the Glorious Revolution, King James was deposed by his daughter Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, leader of the Dutch Republic. Soon after, it was resolved that England would be a constitutional monarchy. Africa. The Songhai, last of the great West African empires, fell to Moroccan forces from the north. In the east, the Ethiopian Empire was alive, run by the House of Solomon, who claimed descent from the old Aksumite Empire and King Solomon. Going through various phases of invasions, centralization and decentralization, the Ethiopian Empire, today Ethiopia and Eritrea, would remain intact until 1974, one of only two African countries to escape colonization. Further south, parts of the Swahili coast came under Portuguese subjugation, but would eventually be taken over by the Omani, a sultanate and maritime empire. Across the Atlantic, Christopher Columbus, enters a fantastical paradise. To Europe, it would be a new land to pursue their economic interests. The first land claimed was that of Latin America, so named because it was Spain and Portugal's to plunder. The Treaty of Tordesillas divided this land, then named Ibero-America, between the two Iberian powers. Portugal named its territory Brazil, after the Brazil wood, which produced dyes. Using gunpowder, Spain had a simple time subverting the natives within its territories. Those too powerful, like the Aztecs, they would use subterfuge. In their quest for precious metals, they would establish viceroyalties like New Spain, and force native peoples to work to extract resources. Their territory spanned all Central and South America. The Portuguese already had lucrative settlements overseas, around Africa, and Southeast Asia with links to both China and India, so their territory in Brazil wasn't as important. There was a dearth of precious metals there as well, so Portugal instead began producing sugarcane. Because of the intense labor of working these plantations, Portugal brought over slave labor from West Africa, kickstarting the Atlantic slave trade. After seeing how lucrative the New World could be, morality notwithstanding, the other Western European powers, with access to the ocean, England, France, and the Netherlands, sought territory in the Americas as well. Some Caribbean islands were taken from the Spanish, but more importantly, North America itself was ripe for conquest. The British began colonization in Virginia, in 1607, and continued until 1733 with Georgia. The Dutch settled further north, in New Netherlands, what would become New York. France colonized even further north, in eastern Canada, founding Quebec City in 1608, and eventually created New France. In the mid-1700s, the Seven Years' War, regarded as the first truly global war, would have consequential effects for the colonies, resulting in France ceding New France to Great Britain, along with Louisiana and all territory west of the Mississippi, to the Spanish. The war took a financial toll on Britain, despite all its territorial acquisitions. Taxes were increased on the 13 colonies in Lower British North America, leading to rebellion in 1775. 
They would declare independence from Britain in 1776, and after a tired British army failed in quelling the insurrection, the Crown finally accepted and recognized America's independence with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. To the north, the colonies of Canada remained loyal to the Crown. Most of the foremost figures from the 13 colonies were heavily influenced by Enlightenment ideals. Beginning in the mid-1600s, the age of rationalism emerged, which differed from Renaissance philosophy. This period saw Isaac Newton write his Principia, and French philosopher René Descartes, famous for his quote, I think, therefore I am. Thinkers around this time tended to be deists, but secular, preferring the church to stay divided from governmental affairs. While the scientific revolution was one of the sciences, the Enlightenment was an intellectual revolution of philosophy, where reason was king, not a fallible monarch, or mystic being in the heavens. This wasn't confined to science, but affected religion, economics, politics, literature, and art. The American Revolution wasn't the only battle spurred by Enlightenment ideals. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. Rampant inequality ran through France. Soon, so did blood. With the abolishment of the Ancien Régime, revolutionaries took control of France, and King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette met their demise in 1793. Terror then reigned. This French Revolution, lasted ten long years, and out of its spent ashes, rose the man who would bring a continent to its knee. The man who would be emperor. Welcome to the longest century ever.